Conti, bella palla per Rebic, Rebic Ibra, Rebic, 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 il tiro, GOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOOO
that ended up being enough because even though Rade Krunic came on and had his usual disaster class in defensive <laughs> midfield, giving away a silly penalty, Caprari dragged it inexplicably wide and uh, we sought out the, the remainder of the game and uh, with Inter having won 6-2 at lunchtime, it was important that we kept the pressure back on and went back top of the table. And we did it. Um, for me, there weren't really many standout performers in the game, to be totally honest. Uh one thing I will say is that it was another big chance for Diogo Dalot at left back um, to to show sort of what we're missing out on because Teo was suspended and uh, there wasn't really anything there from him, to be honest. Um, but again, it's tough to draw too many conclusions from a game where we had a goal lead and we were down to to 10 men for over 60 minutes. At that point, it's just like, a you know, all hands on deck, make sure you get out of there with three points. And that's exactly what we did. So that was good. That was professional. It was the right way to go into this UV game. Um, should we just get it over with? Dissect it. Yeah, we might as well rip the bandage off, haven't we? Um, so twenty-seven game unbeaten run is over. The run of scoring in two, scoring two or more goals in in however many seventeen consecutive games uh, is over. Um, now it's worth noting at this point we were we were decimated by selection problems going into this game. I ain't one for making excuses. These aren't excuses. These are just plain facts. We didn't have Ibrahimovic. We didn't have Salamakas. We didn't have Benacer. We didn't have Gabir, even though he might not have played. Um, we didn't have Tenali, obviously, because he was suspended. And then on the day of the game, we found out that we um, weren't able to uh, pick from Radi Krunic or Ante Rebic either, both of whom would have almost certainly started the game. Uh, because both have cor- uh, contracted coronavirus, obviously we wish them a speedy recovery and all that, but that was a massive dent on the day of the game when you've been working all through training up until the day of the game to find out that we don't have those two players uh, available to us. Um, turns out that it was last night that found out that they tested positive and they waited for the second test this morning. Uh, but that's it, we weren't able to field them. It caused Pioli to shift the lineup around quite substantially. Calabria ended up playing in defensive midfield, the right side of defensive midfield alongside Kessier. Dalot came in at right back. Hauger came in at left wing. Um, and the rest of the line was just kind of cobbled together, I suppose. Um, so one thing I will say, I'll start on a positive point because I don't want it to be too doom and gloom. We lost the game. We lost the game to a side that has a lot of quality and they are a clinical side by nature. Um, you know, whenever you've got sort of Cristiano Ronaldo, Dybala and Chiesa in your attacking group. We, we were going to need to defend well. But despite the lineup that we had to feel, we didn't sacrifice our style and we gave it a really good go. Yeah, you could tell that it was obviously the B team. You know, they, they played the same, um, but far less effective. And, you know, earlier you said these aren't excuses. I, I do think it's an excuse and I think it's a valid one. You know, we're missing four out and out starters essentially five because Calabria, our starting right back, had to play out of position. So there was another substitute in. And with three of those being three of our main attackers and one of them being our best midfielder, you're always going to – it's an uphill battle no matter what. I mean, that's about as valid as, of an excuse for a loss as you could have. Granted, we've gone on without Ibrahimovic, but we've had those other players that were missing were always there without Zlatan. So we were able to make up that for the, the one deficit it's really hard to come back from five starting deficits. It's just, it's an uphill battle and we played great. We played the way we play. It just wasn't enough. And it, it comes down to personnel. I think uh, I, John, you and I talked about this before, mm-hmm. um, before the, the thing started, you know, it's not necessarily depth, but we have depth. It's just that our depth had to start and you can't have depth for depth. It's just, mm-hmm. there's only so many starting 11s you could have. And well, we don't have three, unfortunately it is what it is. People want that wage bill bringing down. You'd need a 30-man first-team squad to cope with what we have going on at the moment, yeah, basically. Yeah. And it, it, it's, like I say, uphill battle is probably the perfect way of putting it. And uh, if they're valid excuses, they're probably just reasons rather than excuses. It, it was hard because I think if someone were to ask me where was this game lost, and Pioli said the, the same after the match um, in his interview, I would say it was lost uh, around the hour mark where we needed to make substitutions that were going to have an impact on the game. Juve brought on over 200 million euros worth of subs 
and we brought on Lorenzo Colombo and the Primavera kids. Like, that was the difference. Without being disrespectful, you know, um, when we went 3-1 down, you could tell Pioli just thought, F it, and threw on Conti, Kalulu, a chance. Uh, Daniel and Maldini. To be fair... All of the substitutes, with the exception of Colombo, who had you know maybe three minutes, mm-hmm. looked pretty good in what they had. I agree. Um, I yelled at Maldini for being selfish and taking that <laughs> shot himself <laughs> instead of passing a wide open for Raheem Diaz, but the run he made to get there and the shot itself were actually pretty good. He actually did a really good move to shift from his right onto yeah. his left foot to avoid, I want to say, Benucci. Oh, it might have been Delict who went fly, flying in. Someone. And even uh, Conte had a, a few nice skill moves, and Kalu had some great recoveries. I mean, they actually oh, looked... Kalu was- Cool, really cool. well i was i was pleased with them and and sure we were three one down and i knew the game was over but the way they were playing i was like maybe this is just the the freshness we need to get at least the second goal and keep that run going you know mm-hmm. and then we had the the clear and obvious penalty appeal that was waved off and not even reviewed but i don't know irati was a terrible referee today i i personally don't think we deserved the first goal i thought that was a foul um so maybe it evens itself out but there was a lot of bad calls as per usual yeah, I was actually kind of optimistic about Irati refereeing this game. Um, more so than if it had been Giacomelli or any of the other sort of more higher profile referees mm-hmm. who we have not tended to, to uh, Orsato enjoy. was the bar ref, which is probably why we didn't get the penalty appeal. And why? Well, no, because actually our goal stood. Um, I remember hearing something, and if you notice for our goal, there wasn't a VAR check at all and the referee just pointed for play to recommence. I remember reading something a while ago, and I don't know if it applies in this case, that um, VAR can't review an incident that is a certain amount of passages of play behind. So in this case, it might have been that there'd been three, four passes, whatever it might be for VAR to no longer be in effect, that it meant they couldn't go back and review it because too much had gone on, gone on afterwards. I don't know if that was the case, but I'm just surprised they didn't even look at it. You I'm know, surprised that... they didn't look at. I'm surprised that they didn't look at it. But for me, I was saying before we started recording that if that had have happened further up the field, I think he'd have blown for a foul. But considering it were in our own half, the ref probably didn't think that anything was going to materialise from it, and that's why he just let play go on and. Then, like you said, too many passages of play came and we scored from it. And that's probably why they didn't go back from it. But had that been further up the field, say on the edge of the Juventus box, then maybe that foul all does get given. Yeah, I think it probably does. Um, I'm not complaining, mind you, because obviously that gave us the little bit of momentum that we needed. Um, great finish by Calabria for the goal. I think I will say Liao, um, I tweeted about it in the first half. I thought he was playing quarterback for us like Ibra does so well. Doesn't necessarily need his physicality. He used more of his, his movement, his pace and his trickery to kind of evade the press. And he did a fantastic job of dropping in and linking uh, with, the, with the trio in behind him and even with the midfielders. That, for me, was a very good centre-forward mm-hmm. performance from him. And, I thought uh, so too. And I, I felt like he needed a bit more help. Um, obviously, no no hate towards Jens Petter, but he is clearly the greenest in the squad and, mm-hmm. you know, needs a little bit more experience, play time, whatever it is. He, there's just something that he's missing. And you notice that, you know, the, the chemistry between the two of them wasn't there or mm-hmm. it, it wasn't accurate enough. There were some poorly placed balls. There were some passes to no one that you could tell were so, they thought one was going to do a run that if Zlatan or Rebic were in, they, they would have been there, would have, they would have known. And, you know, I, I bet Leo could have got another one or uh, one of those other two missing players might have made one. I did notice as well that it looked like um, Jens Petter was a little tentative to actually take a shot. You know, there was a few times when he was in, inside the box, not too deep, um, and he, he could have taken a shot, but instead he he looked for another pass and he, and he took it. And, you know, it wasn't the worst decision, but um, – I don't know. I feel like unless we already have a lead, he's a little nervous to mm-hmm. try and take it himself. It's true. He's got this knack and he of scoring the third goal in three one mm-hmm. wins. But um, he, yeah, he had that one chance where he, the clock, the corner was played. Oh God, the corner was played short, and he made that diagonal run into the box. And rather than pulling the trigger when he had the space to curl an effort sort of in through the crowd of bodies, he ended up taking it so far that he got closed down. Mm-hmm. And then there was the other one where he did this typical trying to bundle through two defenders at once. It worked. And when he could have opened his body up and shot, um, he ended up just doing too much with it and getting robbed. But 
how good you see towards the end um yeah i mean that that didn't make a difference i think ultimately but you see towards the end i think i can't remember who started the pass but it was kind of back and forth between someone and and kessie and he kind of broke through and almost was in on goal and he shot and there was a handball on us that's the exact same goal that he scored in the 4-2 juve victory Mm. last season i don't just fun fact very good uh, observation um yeah, so I mean, I, it's going to have to turn negative at, at this point. Um, so yeah, okay, around the hour mark, like I said, I think the the difference was they were able to bring on quality at a point where they were already a goal up in the game, and we we were not. Um, we our roll of the dice, our only roll of the dice was bringing Brahim Diaz, mm-hmm. Brahim Diaz on. Um, yes, Columbo I didn't like that substitution. Late. I didn't like the way he did it. I thought that it should have been Dallo coming off. For Brahim and have Calabria slide back, have Hakan drop in the midfield, and Brahim up there. I think that would have been more attacking minded and might have maybe pushed for the second goal at the time because at the time it was it was two one. You know, we could have still fought for something there. Mm-hmm. I would like that because it'd have been like four one four one, I suppose as well. In a way, uh, yeah, that was it. That was the hand we were dealt. Um, I know we did make further subs from that, but it, it just. They weren't going to make a massive effect on the game, and they brought on the likes of Kulusevski, McKenney, who ended up scoring the third goal. Of course, um, they were even able to bring on Demiral just to freshen up the defence and and stop us from uh, from causing any problems for them late on. Yeah, I guess it just wasn't our night. Uh, we've got to pick out some individual performances, perhaps that were we picked out Liao. He was good, dynamic. I guess you would say some bad ones. There were some bad ones. Uh, I don't like doing this, but. Um, Teo absolutely lost the battle against Chiesa today. Um, he was beaten pretty much every time. The second goal that Chiesa scored, you know, as a as a forward, you might appreciate just what Chiesa did. It, it was it was good. It was, you know, he picked up the ball fairly cleanly. He knew he was in isolation, and um, he he did well considering that was his weak foot to shoot the way that he did. But then, if you look at it from our point of view. Um, Teo just gives him too much. You know, he, he allows him to run at him. You're saying that have a five yard run at me to one of the best sort of instinctive finishers in the league. And that was it. We, we paid the price for it. Um, I think Romagnoli was a bit off the boil again. Um, we keep talking about his ability or rather lack of ability to come up with a big performance in the big games, particularly the derbies. He's really struggled. And this is another game against Juve where I think he's been found out in certain aspects of his game. Against top quality forwards, he seems to just be um, left wanting a little bit, perhaps. You know, against. I didn't think he was that bad, to be honest. I thought he made a few good saves. Um, he made a couple of good interventions, I suppose you could say. I don't think Kier comes out with high marks from it either, to be totally honest. Yeah, I don't think Kier was great there was a few times that he just completely missed you know mm-hmm. yeah I mean, that's you, true if, on the McKinney goal he mm-hmm. absolutely missed if you look at the first goal it comes down the uh, gap between Teo and Romagnoli on the left side of defense Chiesa gets in there it's a great bit of play by Dybala we know what he's capable of so you should say maybe you need a man pressing right up on Dybala to stop him getting the ball out of his feet but then for him to deliver the pass the way that he did perfect weight perfect angle but Chiesa shouldn't be allowed to make that run. You know, that's the run that mm-hmm. he's... It's his trademark run, to be honest. And the finish was great, yeah. Uh, Donnarumma couldn't do anything about it, really. And then um, the second goal that Chiesa scored, again, preventable. You give Chiesa a run at you um, and you let him up and up and shoot on the edge of the 18-yard box or just inside. He is going to score. Well, there was a lot was... On, on that second goal as well, you know. You know, you have Cristiano Ronaldo running down the left flank with the ball. Calabria from midfield now draws back in that right back position next to Dallo. So they're double teaming him, which fair play. Ronaldo's, you know, arguably one of the greatest players to ever live. So you double team him, but that leaves someone open. That someone was Dybala and you can't do that. And then Dybala passes the ball straight to um, Pernodeski and then, you know, Teo's beat. So there, there was a lot wrong on that second goal. I think that was a complete breakdown of our team. Mm-hmm. And the third goal was the killer when in the time that it came. 
you know, I was screaming at the TV for us just to stay in the game until the last 10 minutes because with a one goal advantage, you never know what can happen. But the third goal really killed us and that was born from defensive disorganisation once again. You cannot allow Kulusevsky to run to the byline in the way that he did. Um, especially when it was to provide an easy pullback for the finish like that. If you can see that if you don't do something, he's going to pass it for an easy 3-1, bring him down. You know, it might be a penalty, but you give yourself a chance of staying in the game. And I know people might not like hearing that, but it was so obvious what was happening um, from from watching it on TV. And yeah, McKenney will not score an easier goal than that, to be totally honest. But again, that is the injection of quality that they had, the two substitutes linking up. And um, yeah, it's 3-1, it's run over. I mean, I will ask a question at this point. Um, Peter Shoup asks, is this beginning of a downhill slide or just a function of absences and fatigue? Do you think this loss will serve as a good lesson or demoralise a young team? I don't know if it's a good lesson. I think it's just a part of... It's part of the sport. No one goes undefeated a full season. I mean, obviously, Milan's done it prior and a few other teams in history, but it's not realistic. That was never our, our goal or expectation this season. Just happened to be a byproduct of a great squad. I think this game we were missing, like we said, five key or six players, five starters, um, and they, they were big ones. We, we didn't have the depth to compete later on because our depth was on the field. And the good news is we've lost games in previous seasons that have crushed us. This typically would be one of those, but this isn't a typical season. We lose this game. Now we get Zlatan back. Then we get Benacer back. Then we get Tonali back next week. You know, we, we get everyone back right away. So it's like, there's that boost you needed to, to continue the run. It's like, damn, bummer. Yeah, I think, Pick I think the main difference is if this was two seasons ago, we would lose the next three or four games. But we have Ibra, and he will be able to motivate this team to come back and continue to win. I wouldn't say it's the start of a downward spiral, but I'm nervous that we've got Torino next just because Gianpaolo is the manager and it's written in the stars that Torino haven't been great this year and no doubt it's one of them games that's going to be very tricky for us and coming off the back of a defeat, not everyone's going to be fit, let's be honest. I think Pioli said post-match that um, he hopes to get him back for the Torino game. I think he meant the Coppa Italy because he says if not, he'll definitely be back for Cagliari. So I'm a bit worried about the Torino game, to be honest. And I hope, I'm not saying it's the start of a downward spiral, but I don't think it's going to be as pleasant on Saturday night. When do we, we get Salamakas back? I agree with you. Salamakas, I don't think will be back. Potentially could be back. Um, yeah. but I, I know we're definitely not going to have Rebic and, and Krunic, but I don't think Krunic is going to play gonna anyways. Have yeah, we won't have Ivra, Rebic or Krunic. Benicer. 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 But Tonali will start. I mean, he's his suspension's up. Mm-hmm. So, at least we're not playing a defender. It's just one of them games that, like, that it's kind of written in the stars that it's going to be a difficult one for us, especially with Jan Paolo out to prove a point. They've got such a good goal for it in Bilotti. It's going to be a tough game, and it's not going to be a walk in the park, but I hope we do bounce back from it. But I wouldn't say start the downward spiral, but I do think it's not going to be a walk in the park either. It's going to be a test of our metal. Like the, the next, the next three games in the league, I would say, a, a really good litmus test for where we're at. You know, yeah, we've got bodies returning, and I kind of like that we don't have four players back at once. Yeah, you might really fancy the injection of fresh legs, but I like sort of in reintegrating them one by one as they get back fit. That should hopefully be good. Torino's going to be difficult because they've actually not picked up, but. The last couple of games, they've been much, much better. They won 3-0 I mean, they, they against Parma, Parma and they, yeah. drew, they got a late equaliser today um, to, to draw. So My they... question for you guys, if, say, Zlatan is confirmed going to be fully fit for the second Torino game, the, the cup match, and w- would you risk him for the league match as well, given everyone else's absence? If league it's only a three-day priority. difference? I agree. Yeah. So league if he's going to be here for sure for the cup, why not, you know? give him 60 minutes or something in the league. I would maybe put him on it after half. Yeah, or bring him of, in for the second half or something. Yeah. yeah. Or they'll maybe let him play first half because you don't want him to have to get up to game speeds uh, so fast. That's true. Maybe start him, take him off at halftime. We, we saw that before after his uh, first injury, right? The way that um, – Last season. The way that Pioli said it was like, um, we don't, we'll see if Zlatan's back for Torino – if not, then he'll definitely be back for Cagliari. 
he almost skipped over that cup game as if like he ain't going to play him anyway. So we'll see if he's back for the Saturday league game. If not, he'll be back for the Saturday. I, I took it the other way. I took it not the both. league game. He'll yeah, be game. I took it that way. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, they'll have their own idea about how they want to manage it. I don't think they'll throw him out there for 90 minutes after two muscle injuries. Let's put it that way. It might be a 30 minute, 60 minute job. Um, but we should still have enough to win both games. If we don't, then I'm going to be worried. Uh, let's put it that way. But um, finally, on the UV game, before we move on, uh, one thing I do want to say is referee bottled a red. Um, ben Tanker should have been sent off for me. Yes. Well, down. Te- Teo should have been sent on. off. Ben yeah. should have been sent off. Should have been a late penalty. There's sh- that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say. Irati was that. irrational. Nice. That's not my irritating. joke. It was Mark Donaldson. Massimo he said irritating. it on ESPN. Sorry. Um, that could have been the pod title if it wasn't the day that it is. Uh, so uh, that was it. Yeah, the only other thing I was going to say is the penalty thing, just so people don't accuse us of forgetting about it. Um, so, yeah, we chart one off. It's a defeat. It's what follows this, as we say, that, that will define our season. Um, Pioli and Perla both said before the game that this is not the game that decides anything at all. You know, Juve is still seven behind us, even though they have a game in hand. Inter lost, thankfully, away at Sampdoria today, so it doesn't become too damaging a defeat. So we've got Torino at home, uh, and then Torino at home in the Cup. Cagliari away, Atalanta at home, Bologna away, Crotone away, Spezia away. It's a nice, it's a nice run of fixtures, and Inter have got to play Juve in two rounds, I believe. Mm. So no, that's a game where, weekend. yeah, they can't both win. So that's a good round for us to hopefully. Who do you rather win that game though? If one has to, which obviously they could draw, but if one has to win, do you pick Juve just because the the point difference and hope they don't draw overcome the rest? Right. If, if, one if, has if to... draw wasn't an option, if one has to, I pick Juve. Inter. I was going to say Juve as well. I'd pick I, it just for the fact here. that if Juventus start picking up the momentum, they'll become unstoppable. Like We've seen it before where they've been uh, quite a few points behind early on in the season. And then they get them a couple of big wins and then suddenly they surge, they become unbeatable. Whereas Inter, I think they can flop in any match. But I'd rather them beat Juve and keep Juve far away and then Inter are going to lose again. Do you know yeah. what? It's just what it's one of them to me where I'd rather Inter beat you this than it beat you. Yeah, I guess. I mean, Inter always crashed the second half of the season. So, yeah. well, I think I we're capable of doing that as well. Like, what we've seen today is that um, we were beaten by what, in my opinion, is nowhere near like the best UV team. You know, they also had a couple of absences. Morata wasn't there, for example. Um, I think. It proves that, like, if we keep being unlucky with injuries or suspensions or COVID, whatever it might be, we are also going to have a real fight on our hands to to keep winning games, especially against the teams around us. I mean, look at Roma. Roma are absolutely flying all of a sudden. They've kind of crept up out of nowhere. But Roma, for all their um, for all their positive traits, keep getting beaten by top teams. You know, they got hammered four 0 by Napoli and. Um, So they've still got their concerns. For us, I think this next few games, without wanting to jump ahead and a touch wood while saying this, it gives us an opportunity to potentially pad a lead at the top of the table that could become so vital. So, so vital. If at any point we can manage to get that lead back up to four points, psychologically it will be huge. But Yeah. I feel bad for John because I've before we started, John and I were talking for like 15 minutes, and I'm literally just repeating everything I said in that. But um, when the, you know when you're in first and the team in second place loses, and the team in then fourth place loses, if there's ever a time to lose to seventh, it was today. But at the same time, that could have given us that extra jump on them. So I, I don't know. It's it's not a bad spot to be in. You know, it's it's okay. This is a game you write off at the beginning of the season. You, you never expect to beat Juve. Anything above a loss is, is a gift. So it was essentially already accounted for, you know, that these weren't three points we were getting. It, we're fine. It's manageable damage, isn't it? it yeah. yeah, it just depends on how we bounce back. We mm-hmm. have to bounce back strong if we want to win the league or qualify for Champions League. Because now 
there's only seven points between us and fifth and eight points between us and fifth, you know? Yeah. How many, there's 21 games left. Yeah. 21 games left in the season. So we're not even halfway done yet. I mean, we got a ways to go. We're good. Yeah. Plenty of football still to be played. Um, Right, a couple of previews, and then we'll move on to the questions in that. Uh, first of all, to, well, actually, it kind of rolls into one, the next we're playing the same team. After a Turin team, we've got another Turin team visiting twice. I wonder if he'll stay for those few nights. No, you can't ask it, Charlie. Yeah, it's only like an hour and a bit away, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you um, get left this morning, then we'll do the same. So, Torino have been in the bottom three uh, since the third round of the season, but they managed to get out uh, with um, their... Hang on. Was it 1-1 one, one draw? Say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they drew one all points. against Hellas Verona. Yeah, they're one place above the relegation zone. Game before that, they beat uh, Parma 3-0. Game before that, they drew 1-1 one, one away at Napoli. Game before that, they drew 1-1 one, one against Bologna. Uh, they've picked up a little bit. They've picked up a little bit of Torino in recent weeks. I don't think they're a formidable beast by any means, and I think Gianpaolo is probably still a little bit on the chopping block because of the start of the season that they had. Um yeah, kind keyword was a little bit, you know, they, they haven't done a whole lot. Like, yeah, they got out of the relegation zone, but they, like we said about our, our chances of winning, their chances of losing, there's still plenty of football left and they've proven that they need a lot more than we do. So um, I think they're still going to struggle. I think they're going to be back in relegation zone fairly soon here. Uh, I'm confident we're going to get a win in both fixtures. I like that. I like that confidence. I'm just looking at Torino's team because I like to do this when we play. Um, obviously, they've got Belotti. Yeah. Um, they're one Zaza. threat, but their defense yeah. is ass. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, bad. I think Apparently that's what's Nettie, been. I like. That's what's been letting them down this season. I don't think they've been playing horrendous football, um, but the defense is killing them, and it's that is why they're so far down. If not, I don't think they'd be top half, but I think they'd be maybe 13, 14, comfortable if it wasn't for yeah. the defence. I don't think we keep a clean sheet here. I, I think yeah. the probably going to bag another. Um, but luckily, we're a team that scored two-plus goals in you know 16 of our last 17 games or whatever it is now. Um, so, you know, have only, only failed to score in two games this season, which backs up what you were saying about us not keeping a clean sheet. I don't... Every game that we're going to, I don't think we keep a clean sheet. It's just... Across the back four, there's always one player that looks a liability. Maybe except Kier that will make a mistake or will just get a wonder strike against us. It's, I just don't ever feel confident going into a game that we won't concede. And I I'm getting more confident, that. weirdly, especially after today, simply because I saw how well Conti did with his few minutes and Kulu with his, plus Kulu's run in the previous games. I, I think we're starting to get some decent depth now at... at um, the back line there. Hope so. Hope so. I, I'm not sold on Dalot, but I think that's probably Delo. Sorry, it's probably something for another episode. But um, this, like, this should be uh, a double stretch of games where we are looking to win comfortably. Um, clean sheet or no clean sheet doesn't really matter. I suppose at the end of the day, we've got to get three points, and then if we have to rotate players, it's just about getting into the into the hat for the next round. Um, but there's nothing in Torino's squad that scares me apart from Milotti and, you know, and the fact that Gianpaolo's manager, it would just be too good a story almost. Um, we've actually been linked with a couple of their players over the last few days, Nkulu, the centre-back, and uh, Swali Hometi, the midfielder. Um, both of those are actually pretty good, in my opinion. But I feel like it's a little late for Nkulu. He used to be good, but I feel like... He's gone downhill every year since well, like since 13, he 14. Stopped, since he stopped playing Armando Izzo, uh, I think... He's gone think down Kul- too. I Kul- used to Kul- love Izzo. I, I wanted him like a couple seasons ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah. He was linked with a lot of top clubs like that, um, Inter and stuff, but I said top clubs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, those links aside, I think we should be winning this. Um I'll, we'll do the league game first. I'm actually going to say we win both 2 0. I was going to say 2 1 for both. I don't know about 2 0, but I bet 2 um, 0 for the league game and then the cup game will be a little bit closer, maybe 2 1. Oh, we had that really, really entertaining cup game against them last season where we were trailing until very late on. I say 
we draw 2-2 two -two at the weekend and then beat them marginally 1-0 in the Cup. Because I think in the Cup game, we're going to be playing players like Colombo, Maldini, Hauga, Diaz, all from the start, just to give the players a week-long rest so we're fit for the league. Because I think that is our priority at the minute. I think Hauga is going to start the, at the weekend as well. Because Rebic is still going to be gone. He's not coming back yet. He'll be out for a week or two. Yeah, that's true. Unless we play Diaz on the left. And mm -hmm. then, I don't there's a lot of interchangeable players in that. Or if Slatan comes back, then Liao on the left. Yeah. I mean, I'll be, I think saying, we, go on. I'll be saying it for a couple of weeks. I'm just not sold on Halga at the minute. Like, yeah, I think he's got a lot of potential. But if anyone needs a word move at the minute, it seems to be him. He's been good in Europe. But whenever he's got a chance in Serie A, bad, maybe the Napoli game, he hasn't really done. He's, he can press the ball, but every time he's on it, he looks a bit like a headless chicken when he's running. And I think a load move to another Serie A club would be very beneficial for him. If we can, if we've got the depth up there. We don't. I think that's the problem. Allow us to do I, it. I don't think we can. We'd be stuck with no one if we loaned him out now, for example. It's all right, sort of presuming that we, we've got players who can stand in. Um, I did see one journalist on Twitter say that we'd rejected a loan bid from Bayer Leverkusen. Yeah, which shows the kind of clubs that are circling. I think we keep him. I think we keep him here and we let him grow with our style. Even if he only gets fleeting minutes over the next few months, I think it will be important for him. If we're keeping Daniel Maldini and Colombo around, then how can more than earns his spot based on what we've seen so far? I but think I what we do, much better in Europe. we loan him out specifically to Dortmund and tell him it's not because we think you need to get better. It's so you can flirt with the Holland. Tell them, hey, come over here, bro. <laughs> and then Dortmund buy Hauke for 15 million in the summer. <laughs> exactly. So that's that. Uh, unbeaten run done, whatever. We move on. Uh, hopefully we can do the other Turin team. That would be nice. Market stuff then. So we've had a couple of... Oh, first of all, I have to say, uh, we are delighted to have Pietro Balzano Proto on our team. PPP Calcio, as you may better know him from Twitter. Uh, he'll be providing updates on the market throughout the month for us. We're, like I say, we're absolutely delighted to have him um, have him join up with us. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to find his stuff uh, straight away on the website, just go up to news. It's on the drop down bar exclusive. And that's where all his, all his stuff will be for the month. We'll, we've had some tasty stuff already. Um, so we'll talk about the two signings that appear to be the closest at the moment. We've spoken at length, I suppose, a bit already about Mohamed Simakan um, and come to the conclusion that none of us are avid watchers of Liga and therefore don't know too much about him. The hope is that this gets done in the next few days. Um, there are some sources who are suggesting that he could actually have played his last game for Strasbourg today. His barber actually posted something on Snapchat saying the last one as he was doing his hair, so that implies that Something's, uh, something's happening. Simakan himself posted on Instagram. Um, he's currently got purple hair, or he did at the time he posted it. And he posted a picture of him with red and black hair uh, that said loading. And yeah, often you read too much into social media, but that for me is pretty blatant. Um, and it seems like it's going well. Uh, Leipzig have tried, as Pietro told us, uh, Leipzig tried to enter the race, but he only wants to join us. It's going to be somewhere between 15 to 20 million euros by the sounds of it. Very highly rated in France. And for me, I don't know, it makes me feel a bit safer knowing that Leipzig also want him because they mm -hmm. haven't really missed with a lot of their re recruitment. So uh, Neither is Maldini, me. though. So I trust, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's further, further valid see someone. validation, whatever the word is. Um, so uh, scale of 1 to 10, how excited about are you about the idea of Simicam joining? Six and a half, simply because it's more depth in a position that prior to today, I was like, yeah, hey, we're pretty weak in. But now I know that we'll have Kululu and Simikin, plus Gabia whenever he returns. That, that's exactly what we need. You know, we, we saw Juve today bring on Demiral in the 90th minute for shits and giggles because they have that many great defenders. It'll be nice if we could do the same. So I, I think he's pretty solid. I've watched a lot of comps on him and he looks great. Obviously, that's the whole point of a compilation video is to make someone look great, but it definitely worked and he had a lot of material for it. So I'm game. For me, it's between a five and a six. I just, I haven't seen enough of him to warrant any higher. Um, I think until we get rid of Masakio and Duarte, I don't really see the point in bringing in another centre-back until they're gone. Obviously, we need one, but 
like when you look at the bench today and there was two centre backs on it, three if you include Clulu, plus Conte, to add another centre back to that. It's just piling up the wage bill. Um I hope he can do good. Um I kind of feel like I don't want to say it, but this could be a potential Romagnoli replacement, not for the future, but at the present, because he looks he's one of the liabilities out of the two of Kier and himself. And I think he could slot in. Simicon could slot in instead of Romagnoli and potentially it could lose Romagnoli's place, especially with the Donnarumma contract Neil coming up and a potential captaincy armband being waved around. I don't know, I just feel like that it could potentially happen. I would 100% support, support giving Donnarumma captain's armband. I think he's way more vocal during the game. Yeah. Um, but I've also been cr- been critical of Romagnoli for the past season and a half. Like, I think he's reached his potential. I don't really see him getting vastly better. Uh, so if we can invest in a young center back who can surpass his talent, then I'm all for it. I also think, yeah, Kier's 31. That's worth bearing in mind. But I think Kier would really benefit from having someone quick and um, – very athletic next to him, which would allow him to focus on on his strengths. What would happen is I would imagine Kier would shift over actually, um, and he would he would be on the left side of defence because Simakan is very right footed, um, can also play right back as well, which is worth bearing in mind. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're bringing him in because well, you bring a player like that in because you surely have a view to them being a starter, whether that be being Kier's long term replacement or what. I don't know, but they they see a future for this kid. Um, and the way that Maldini's spoken about him, to me, fills me with great confidence. They really think that, that this guy is a gem for the future. I'd almost be worried if we were bringing him in with the intention of throwing him straight into the firing line. I don't think that's what you should do with any new signing. Um, in fact, we got a question about this, which I might as well ask now. Um, it comes from Eli. With new arrivals hopefully happening soon, how long would you allow them to develop before throwing them in and against which team? Obviously, we don't know when they're going to come. It could be tomorrow he arrives from medical. It could be two, three weeks. We know what the Milan market's like. But it's clear that we we give our new signings quite a bit of time to adapt and to learn the game system and all that kind of stuff before we throw them in. I mean, it took us ages to see to see the likes of um, Hauger from the start and to see Brahim and stuff like that. So And Tonali's obviously been eased in as well for the same reason. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't put anything... Uh, definitive on that at the moment um, but I, I'm excited by it. I, I would put it around about a, a, a 7 out of 10 because of the cost effectiveness of the deal hopefully he's 20 years old you know we could potentially get 10 12 years out of a player like this and for 15 mil whatever it might be it seems like a bargain and hopefully it comes good um, the other guy and again it sounds like we're having to beat some competition from Germany is Coadio Kone from Toulouse. So if you don't know much about French football and you don't know much about Simakan, you probably know even less about uh, Kone, given that he plays in um, the second division in France with Toulouse. Uh, but he's, he's definitely um, fits the physical mould of what we've been saying we need for a while now, which is a deputy to Kessier uh, because of his physicality, uh, because of his muscle, because of the role that he would play. Uh, as the deeper of the two midfielders. So that in itself ticks a box. Um, In terms of top flight experience, perhaps not. But in terms of us then being able to get a deal done for what might be somewhere between 5 and 10 million euros, that makes it seem like a low-risk investment. Um, Again, I think he's only 19, so even younger than Simakam. We clearly see something in the French market. I know Maldini said, he went on record as saying that he likes the French league because all the players are already built athletically to play a high intensity style. What he can then do is teach them the intricacies of the game, um, which I like. He, he thinks that he can coach players mentally, but if physically they're not there, which I think is probably the case for Duarte and for Conte and for these players, Musaccio, that have found themselves on the outside of the project. You know, um, they've, give, they've shown what they can do in terms of the, um, the mental side of the game um, and they've got experience but uh, physically their bodies just aren't holding up with this style. I think Maldini's saying we're going the other way now. We're going to get players in who we know can keep up with this and uh, then we can coach them into being what we want. Um, so, yeah, Kone, I'm guessing... 
there's not many videos of him knocking about, to be fair. Um, but he looks pretty dynamic. He kind of reminds me in a way of, you know, we were linked with the Benfica lad, Florentino Luis, mm-hmm. in the uh, summer, throughout the summer. And he ended up going to Monaco, I think he went to in the end. Yeah. Uh, reminds me of sort of like that little tenacious, um, will nip the ball off you when you don't expect it at all. Can also kind of drive play forward. So I'm excited about this one because of the price. I give it a 7.5 because I think it really fills a hole that we need. We, we need a fourth midfielder and who better to put there than a promising 19 year old who can grow fit midfielder Krunic is not going to play there again for the rest of his life <laughs> not if he doesn't recover from COVID um, which I beat <laughs> oh that's very uh, morbid to be fair that is very morbid <laughs> wow <laughs> it's okay oh congrats uh, yeah. welcome back by the way yeah, well done, I... yeah no longer a statistic um, quicker recovery. I guess you are, I really. guess. Yeah, I guess I'm more of one now. Um, but anyways, I if so if we go off the logic that Maldini doesn't miss and this will be a great signing for the future, then because we need someone for this position, because we obviously learned today that we just we don't have enough there, um, then this is like an eight for me. You know, going off the assumption that he's a great player, we need someone. So, and I don't think he's going to be starting over Tonali or Benacer or Kessie, but that's not what he's there for. You know, he's there to slot in afterwards. So even if it's just to give Kessie a little bit of a break in the 70th, 80th minute, bring him on if there's a similar profile, like they say, then fantastic. I really like the idea of um, if both had been in and both be fit, both eligible, whatever, that like cup game, if we're going to be savvy about it, we're going to rest bodies and stuff that, okay, first choice duo, Kessie, Benacer, Rotate them both out. Kone, perfect replacement for Kessier. Tonali, perfect replacement for Ben Asser. There's that kind of box-to-box pushing presence. That yeah. is where you think we've got two, two quality. We've got one world-class quality pair in there and one has the potential to become a quality pair in. So that, it makes sense. And, and that's how you avoid drop in form when you make substitutions, is you have the backup fit the same mold. The system mm-hmm. doesn't have to change for this. We don't have to make any adjustments. You slot right in like for like. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. For me, it's probably a seven. I'm more excited for him than I am Silicon, just purely because it is a position we're desperate for. I don't think, like I said before, I don't think centre backs a position we're desperate for at the minute with what is it like six potential centre backs on the books. Um, so yeah, I'd give this one a seven. I'm looking forward to it, but I'd rather, I would rather the fourth choice centre midfielder be a little bit more experienced because I feel like I've got three young players. But if you add a fourth experienced one to the mix that can come in instantly and do a job and not have to worry about how raw he is, it'd be a bit more beneficial. But yeah, I'm excited. Problem is, you'll do well to find a, an experienced player who's not going to be fourth spot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, it's ideal world. Yeah. Same with, like, we talk about the potential of bringing back Rudiger. It's like, good job selling him on the fact he's going to be a fourth choice centre back, considering that he's probably then got a better prospect of playing at Chelsea. Um, but yeah, it's just the market. I think it's it's targeted recruitment. It's smart recruitment. I put a tweet out saying um, because you know there's there's been all kinds of rumours both from France and in Italy that we're still on pole to get uh, Talvin. Probably going to be the end of the season, so we avoid paying a fee. And I wouldn't upset the balance that we have on the wing at the moment. Um, I'm not. I'm still not. Never going to be sold on Samu Castillejo. Um, I, I think that ship has sailed now because of his inconsistency. But Salamakas, you know, I think it would be very harsh to bench him by bringing in a winger uh, midway through the season. We've seen how important he is. Keeps the run going as well, by the way, by not playing tonight, of, of never having lost. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes sense to bring him in, free transfer, ahead of the new season, give him a full pre-season to kind of uh, learn the system and, and learn what's required of him. But the idea of getting um, one of France's highest rated Defenders under 21 in Simakan, um, a talented midfielder in a spot that we need, and Talvin, you know, a, a World Cup winner, a very experienced winger, goals and assists guaranteed. To get those three for the combined transfer fee of around 20 million euros, it can't go wrong, surely. Like, you pay 20 million euros for some really shit players nowadays. I mean, you know, I know we got Teo for, for 20 Kalachi. million, but also they want. Sco- they want 25 mil for Scamaccia. And you think, mm-hmm. I think Danny Drinkwater went for like 30 million. So, 
I will never say a bad word about Danny Drinkwater. Town legend. Huddersfield town legend. <laughs> Same with Ben Chilwell, to be fair. Um, we are literally the academy. I actually like football. Chilwell. I think Chilwell has done well. But... Man, he's, he's the only player that we've had on loan at Huddersfield where I've said to the people around me, he's going to play for England one day. He was just that good when he was with us. And sure enough, he has. Uh, right. Questions. Marco Vieja. I hope I've said that right. After today's match, where do we need to strengthen? Midfield. Midfield. I will say, I, I think... Um, I, don't if, I don't know if it was you who said it, AJ, earlier, but I don't think Calabria had a terrible game, to be honest, in defensive no, field. I think he but would have been better switch. used in defence. You know. Yeah, in his natural spot. Once again, I remember absolutely nothing about what Dallo did, apart from have that shot saved. Um, he had a few really good crosses and a few really bad crosses that had a nice curve on it. But I don't understand why we kept crossing when it was so obvious that that wasn't going to work for us because Liao ain't going to score headers from crosses. Because when we're desperate and we have Zlatan in, it does work. That's true. It's almost as if they were saying, Zlatan, please, <clears throat> look yeah. at what we're doing here. We need you back, mate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, midfield unanimously agreed. We need a, a, a reliable fourth choice midfielder and um, attack. What were you thinking there? No, Jan, yeah, I thought you said attack. Oh, sorry, it just all completely froze. <laughs> um, <What? laughs> yeah, no, um, for the attack, I'd like to see a right winger come in, and I was totally against this at one point. I just think Castillo is that kind of impact sub that if he comes on, you feel like, yeah, he's got a goal in him. Um, as far as the maker kind of fits only one system which is the press um, but a, a, a Turban type player um, would be perfect someone that will just run at defenders all day he'll take him on he can score goals provide assists and it just gives us a completely different game plan um, when we need it I said in the group chat the difference between um, Castillejo and, and Talvin is that that chance early on when he kind of stumbled almost into possession from that giveaway is that uh, with Tovin, he makes that 1-0. Castillo sent a weak shot at the near post that was turned behind for a corner. Tovin absolutely scores that. Um, yeah, I think if, if offers come in for Castillo in and around the 10, 15 million euro ballpark and take we it. could then get... Take it, yeah. And if we can then get on the phone to Marseille and say, look, here's your money. We, we need him now as the replacement. Then I think you do it. Because then it's obvious, you know, we've got two right-sided players. Yeah, um, yeah if you can reach too. an agreement with him to make it a free, like, have that a done deal, <laughs> then you get some Castillo money and be like, look, we've already signed him for a free. If you want anything, you're going to take three mil, you know? I've noticed that you um, get away with it. Marseille have pretty much gone for his replacement too, that Demari Gray from Leicester. Sounds mm -hmm. like they're going to sign him on a free transfer to replace him, so that that's that. Um, yeah, I, I would jump the gun on that if we got a decent offer for Castillo. Um, right, next question. Hang on, what was Matt's question? Sorry, Pat's question. I'll read that. Out now. Let me just quickly find that. I've got it. Uh, regarding the Benevento it. match, are we seeing a development of GGO's game? We know he's a great shot stopper, but has his claiming of crosses improved? And was this something that we've not seen before from him? I think so. Yeah, I think he's getting better every game. Um, his distribution was the main thing people would shit on him for, and I think that's improved better immensely. Today. Did you yeah, notice the amount of times that he came and claimed the ball and then rolled it straight out to someone and we had an overload on, on the yeah. break? Well, when he makes that <laughs> easy little roll to Teo, it's, it's always an attack, you know? And the mm -hmm. only reason he got stopped this time was because he was fouled, but that's almost always in on goal every single time. Yeah, that's actually one of our main attacking set players now is that to be honest, mm -hmm. the role to Teo and TGV. Something that's been worked on in the training ground because Teo always seems to just be from a defending corner lurking anywhere where Gigi catches the ball. Teo's literally there in an instant and mm -hmm. it just it takes off. But yeah, I think I think he's improving week in, week out. There were, I think, one cross today that he came for and he flapped, but um, or it just went over and kind of. But other than that, from where he was four years ago with his distribution, his. Um, playing the ball at the feet, uh, he's improved massively and I think he's just getting better and better. So much of goalkeeping is confidence and the amount of confidence that he has 
because of the experience he has under his belt, but the amount of confidence he has at 21 years old is kind of frightening. You know, I've never seen that well-rounded a goalkeeper at 21 years old before. Um, he's he's kind of a freak in that sense. Um, and he is only going to get better, 100%. And um, that makes me very excited for the future. It almost makes me happy that we're negotiating his renewal now and we might get him somewhere around the 7 million net mark because we know that he could potentially go elsewhere and fetch nearly double that. Um, so it would be nice just to get him to put pen to paper. Um, would No. I mean, I know this is fantasy football and it would never happen, but would you be against saying, all right, we'll give you 8 mil or 9 mil, but sign an eight-year deal? Oh, I'd give him 8 mil right now for a four-year deal. <laughs> so... Well, yeah, yeah another that's four true. years on there. Fuck but yeah. he's paying that bit more, no release clause, and say properly commit your future to us. Yeah, but I know yeah as long as we put in there, like, we're not going to renegotiate halfway through this. Like, you're on an eight year deal. <laughs> I know Rayola's never, never going to sign that because he wants to never. renegotiate. Rayola doesn't have years. to sign it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I've been saying this for weeks again. It's it's one of them. Donna Rumor is the person that signs the contract to him. It's starting to get a bit boring now, the whole saga around him. If he wants to sign the contract, he goes into the office and he signs the contract at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. That simple. It is that simple for me. It does sound like, um, from the reports that you, you read and stuff you hear from journalists who are, are pretty well regarded, that what's happened between Donnarumma and Raiola is almost an agreement within itself because Donnarumma has gone to Raiola and said, I don't want to move in my career. I want to stay here for the rest of my career. Bad news for Raiola, who now can't get any commission from one of his best clients. So I think in exchange for that, Donna Rumor has said to Raiola, get yourself every penny that you can, you know, negotiate me the best terms possible, but I want to stay. And I think that's yeah. a fair compromise, to be honest. I think it's a fair as long compromise. as uh, PSG and Chelsea aren't going to come in and swoop in and, uh, and give him 14 mil a season, you know? But I guess well, didn't he turned that down already. Like, didn't PSG offer him like twelve or something a couple years back? I mean, they, if he said no to that, then then I don't see him doing it any. any no to that was a rumor. Saying. I mean, I guess this is technically a rumor as well, but yeah, mm-hmm. okay, fair. I think he's a fair compromise. But I just feel like if you want, to, if you are dead certain about committing your future to the club, you'd want to put your your fans' minds at ease. You'd want to put the club at ease. Everyone around you at ease and you just go into the boardroom you say right what are you off me or oh, these are my terms sign the contract and it's done and dusted I think it the longer it drags on the more worried I become about it yeah Same. Uh, I just it, think when you, it, you have as dance. much when you have as much talent as Donnarumma does you have to get a super agent like Raiola who's going to get you every penny and it, it's rough because if you want to stay at a club forever Raiola is not the guy to have then who is, you know, you, you don't get one of these low level agents to magically get you the, the great deal that you can, you know, Raiola has a reputation of getting his clients a good deal. And that's why he has so many clients. So I, I see why he's still with him. And I don't think you would leave him until it do, no longer becomes beneficial for, for Raiola to have him as a client. You know, if he's not getting any commission, if, if we pull, um, uh, I'm so happy. I can't remember his name anymore, but our old sporting director under Yong Hong, what was his name? With an M. Mirabelli. Mirabelli. Mirabelli didn't give Raiola any, any agent fee, and he was so proud about it, but it's like, I don't know. It, that's not how you keep happy happy clients. Dare I say, he didn't directly give him um, any commission, but what he did do is agree to sign in his older his brother, brother on a one million net, one, well, two million gross deal, so I think uh, Raiola might have got a nice signing on fee from that, to be honest. Right, exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. He was very mean... specific to say no bonus on right or on GGO's yeah. deal. He didn't say anything about the others. Clever, though. I mean, it's an indirect way of, of doing it. Um, I think everything suggests from all of the reliable sources that this gets done. Um, and I think it will get done. Um, the reason that it's been allowed to go on is because I don't think that they're worried. You know, I, I think that there is an acknowledgement that, yeah, he's got six months left on his deal, but he ain't going to sign a free con- a free contract anywhere else. He's just not. You know, he wants to stay. He came out in the media and said he wants to stay. You know, I would be absolutely astonished, as would you three, if we woke up tomorrow and it turns out he's agreed to pre-contract with Chelsea or with PSG. Well, because there's was nothing it, that suggested that that's going to happen. I'd was be it Inter or I... Juve, one of them? There was a rumour the other day where they supposedly asked for a meeting and he just straight up said no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. 
I'd be astonished if we did sign it, but I just feel like the longer this season does go on, um, say, for example, we do slip out of the top four race or we just slip out of the top four, Jesus your needs to be playing Champions League football and I'd just rather get it done sooner rather than later where we've got him for the next four or five years and the chance of us playing Champions League football next year is greater. But if we didn't play it and it comes to a month away from him being a free agent, I think his eyes will start to wander. wonder. I can see that. Never gets to a month away. He might get to like three, four months away, but I don't think... I think it gets done by the end of this month, to be totally honest. Um, you're right about him deserving... I don't think it gets done this month. I, think I don't we're think so at, either. Like, March. I don't think it does. I was the longer, March as well. Every day that it goes on, it just seems like an extra needs drama. to get done this month. But I just think we're going is... to focus on incoming transfers right now. If if Donnarumma is so vocal about, I'm going to stay here the rest of my career, then it's not a priority. Put so get, get the transfers done. So you know what your budget is after that, after you've completed your market, then you could do your renewals with, you know, solidarity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just see it getting done. I, I see the Charlie Unglue thing getting done as well because as time goes on, those links are kind of vanishing and it's more optimism filtering that we're going to find a meeting point around the 4 million net mark, which I don't mind at all. I really don't. Um, I, I think now... There's another the renewal where... as well, isn't there? Latin. Yeah. yeah, there's some in 2022. Yeah. 2022, we've got um we've got Calabria, Kessier, and Romagnoli. I could have sworn there was a third one for, for this term though. I would sell uh, Romagnoli this summer. Oh Musacci, yeah, yeah, he's gonna expire. Conti's twenty two oh. as well. Um how long yeah, does so Duarte they're... have? Because if Musacci is expiring, 24. I guess we're bringing in some again. Oh jeez. We signed him all on five-year deals in summer 2019. So that was the point, is that the transfer fees were pretty much all divisible by five Yeah. Um, for amortisation. So, yeah, I think Charlie O'Glu and Donnarumma renew. We've seen nothing recently to suggest that either are heading towards an imminent exit. I'll be shocked um, if, if either of them leave, to be totally honest, at this point. But if Charlie O'Glu were to leave, for example, in terms of the gross salary, we'd see if we'd be able to go out and get a replacement. Um Right, a couple more questions. People, as the season goes on, does the depth of Juve and Inter start to hurt us? Um, I, I don't think it does. I think it hurt us there because of the unprecedented amount of injuries we had and obviously the two COVID cases this morning. But once the transfer market's done and we get a fully fit squad back, I don't think we're ever going to be in this position again where we've got this many injuries. So I think we'll be able to compete with them. Yeah, to me, it just comes down to if, if our guys are fit or not. You know, if, if they're fit, then we have the depth. If they're not, then we don't. I think Inter are going to get done at some point. Um, I know they did have a couple of problems when they played us, but as I keep saying, they they had a bit of a scare, actually, against Crotone because Lukaku came off with a thigh injury. Turns out he was fine to play uh, however long, 20 minutes today against Sampdoria, but um, I think that's a little problem for them. And uh, their, their Lukaku injury away from from finding things really tough, I think. Um, perhaps also a defensive injury away. Juve, I don't know. I don't think Juve will be hit as hard. I think that their depth is almost more of a constant level than everybody else's. Um, they can, you know, lose Benucci and bring in Demiral. Um, they had Chiesa playing um, and they were able to bring on uh, Bernadeschi. Ooh, what, yeah, whatever you think of him. Um, so... Um, will the depth start to hurt us, like you guys said, uh, only if our depth is hurt? You know, we'll, we'll get guys back by the end of January with a couple of new reinforcements, with all the guys back. Uh, Gabby are back early February, I think, and we've got a pretty much fully fit squad. Then we're looking very good, we're looking good. We're looking like we can compete on all three fronts again: League Cup and, and Europa League. Um, Luciano Perani says, considering all our absences, I was kind of satisfied with our performance today. Can't come up with a question. Um, so I'll just wish you a happy new year instead. Well, happy new year to everyone happy else new year, as man. well. Actually, yeah. uh, probably should have said that at the start, to be honest, as well. <laughs> um, happy new year to all of our listeners, given it's the first time that we're recording this year and everything. Oh, it is. man, um, I feel like this year's already been so long. Oh, I, know. I know. It's only been a week. Jeez. Not even um, six days in. Jeez. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it, to be honest, lads. Um, so we'll cut it there, conscious of time and everything. 
Um, yeah, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. You can find me on Twitter at Ollie Fisher or at Kilpin Chronicle. Been joined by Anton Togu. Yep, glad to be back. Um, don't see that changing. I'll be here next week. Oh, oh, next week we're um, changing recording days. We're going to be recording on weekends as opposed to midweek. So um, be on the lookout for episodes on the weekend now. But follow me on Twitter at Twitter 45 Yeah, um, glad to have everyone back. Edward underscore underscore t- underscore Toth. Yeah, thanks for having me once again, lads, and hopefully I'll see you next week. Follow me at UK underscore AC Milan. He's got it right for the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, and just before signing off, a reminder, go check out our exclusive transfer news. Delighted to have Pietro on board. That'll be some good stuff. Of course, you'll be able to find it on our Twitter feed too. Um, hopefully should have some exciting news regarding uh, video stuff video podcast related things um, to announce soon as well and uh, check out our shop if you haven't already go to the website and uh, there is now a little box where you can go to our shop and, and buy products with one of our three designs really appreciate the support on that front um, if you're wanting to support the podcast I'm wondering why we don't have a Patreon or anything like that uh, don't worry about it if, if you buy our merchandise then that is literally the best support really just getting our designs out there and stuff and let us know if there's anything you'd like to see us do um, so yeah, we also all much. have Venmos. <laughs> you can just give us money. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Send us Bitcoin. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you again in a week's time. Andrea Conti, bella palla per Rebic. Rebic, Ibra. Rebic, 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 Rebic. Il tiro. Goal!